All right, we're going to try this. Um, a number of people have asked me to do podcasts. This isn't really a podcast. It's more like a video of me reading some of my posts. So um, I'm going to start trying to do this, see if it works. Um, right now, the post that I'm going to read is part eight of my Nye Ham debate series. Um, so I'm just going to read it, see what you think. This is the Nyham Debate, Part 8, entitled, Seven Things to Do or Do Not Do, There Is No Try. Here we come to Part 8 of my month-long homage to the debate between Bill Nye and Ken Ham that took place four years ago. The focus of these posts has been the analysis that Ken Ham and Bodie Hodge gave of that debate in their book, Inside the Nyham Debate. The focus of these posts, though, has not so much been on the actual arguments made during the debate as it has been on Ken Ham and Bodie Hodge's take on that debate. In short, it has been on the smoke and mirrors young earth creationist groups like Answers in Genesis adeptly use to avoid addressing challenges to their young earth creationist claims. In part seven, I summarized Ham and Hodge's use of these smoke and mirrors in their attempt a, to delegitimize the scientific evidence Bill Nye gave of the old earth. B, to distract their followers from the actual topic of the debate. C, to demonize Bill Nye himself. And D, to declare a call to arms in their culture war. Now, if you've read that post, you no doubt were struck how Ham and Hodge completely dismissed any and all evidence for an old earth as, quote, mere assumptions and fairy tales. Fossils, rock layers, ice cores, tree rings, distant starlight, all received the same reaction. Was Bill Nye there? It's all just assumptions. Bill Nye is dishonest and relies on the mythologist of human evolution, humanistic evolution. And Ken Ham is wise to rely on God's historical science textbook. I ended that post by asking a simple question. How should a Christian go about addressing the claims of young earth creationism? In this post, therefore, I want to contemplate that question and offer some reflections. So let's start off with some personal stories. Although most of the responses I have received about both my book, The Heresy of Ham, and the numerous posts I've written this month on the Nye-Ham debate, there have been a few comments and questions to the effect of, why are you attacking your fellow brother in Christ? Well, believe me, when I wrote my original blog post on the debate four years ago, I never imagined I would still be writing about young earth creationism four years later. In fact, I wrote about my thoughts on the debate just to clarify in my own head what I felt the fundament, fundamental issues of the debate were. I thought I'd write my few posts, move on, focus my teaching classes, focus, focus on teaching my classes working on finishing up my four-year worldview curriculum that I had hoped to eventually get published. Well, as things turned out, those posts ended up being used against me by a rather overzealous young earth creationist headmaster to eventually oust me from my job. Needless to say, my experience over the last four years has made me realize that young earth creationism isn't just a fringe movement that Christians can amicably disagree about. Young earth creationists, like Ken Ham, do not allow that as an option. In addition, I've also come to realize that most evangelical Christians have never really thought much about this issue or really think it is all that important. Consequently, many are surprised, like I was, when they realize that there are those who are insistent that belief in a 6,000-year-old universe is a core tenet of the Christian faith upon which the gospel rises or falls. My friend Ian Panth has recently written on his blog about how quickly young earth creationists demonize you as soon as you let on that you don't believe the earth is 6,000 years old. Just the other day, excuse me, just the other day, a friend of mine from church told me about a recent experience she had in her homeschool group. They were planning to use some young earth creationist science textbook. And when she asked why, they said, well, we're Christians and they practically treated it as if it were a salvation issue. And over the past year, I've gotten numerous responses to my posts on young earth creationism 
by people who have been deeply hurt by young earth creationists, particularly Ken Ham, and who almost lost their faith because of the way they were treated. Simply put, if young earth creationism was just another secondary issue Christians tended to disagree on and felt free to debate and discuss, I doubt I'd be writing about it, and I doubt I would have lost my job over it. But the fact is, young earth creationists like Ken Ham feel it is their duty to declare war on fellow Christians who disagree with their young earth creationist claims. If you don't believe me, just join a young earth creationist Facebook group and say, I don't see what the big deal is if you think the universe is 14 billion years old. A lot of Christians don't read Genesis 1 literally. Just sit back and let the comments come in. I think you'll see what happens. The reality, though, is the facts of science, proper biblical exegesis, and church history are not on Ken Ham's side. That's a big problem for organizations like Answers in Genesis. And as I've shown in the previous seven posts, you can say that Answers in Genesis strategy can be boiled down to this. If you can't debate, obfuscate. I think I said that right. And if you take the time to slow down and actually pick apart what they say, as I've tried to do in, these, in this series, you realize that their arguments have more holes in them than Swiss cheese that have been blown apart by a shotgun. And if you visit the Ark Encounter, some of the stuff is, well, just plain silly. Elephants on treadmills on the Ark, powering a pulley system that helps dispose animal waste in the sea. If you'll read my blog post, I actually have a video of it that you can watch. A priest floods civilization that has coliseums where giants threw innocent people to the velociraptors. Noah had ac access to incredible pre-flood technology that would have put our modern technology to shame. Where is any of that in the Bible? For someone who claims to be upholding biblical authority, Ken Ham certainly has a tremendous ability for telling some incredibly tall tales. So what is one to do or not do? And this brings me to the main question for the post. How is a thoughtful Christian to deal with young earth creationism? Here's my advice. Number one, don't bury your head in the sand. Don't be like I was and think that this is not a big deal and that honest Christians can have different opinions on the issue. Realize that for the real hardcore young earth creationists, this is an issue of life and death. For them, as crazy as it may sound, if the earth is 14 billion years old, then Christ died for nothing, and the gospel is undermined. Number two, don't be fooled into thinking this is a big deal. I'm not contradicting myself. What I mean here is that no matter what anyone may tell you, the age of the earth is utterly irrelevant to the gospel. No matter what anyone might tell you, the reality of human beings' sinfulness is not dependent upon whether or not there was a literal couple named Adam and Eve. What is a big deal is this, loving God and loving your neighbor. It is sacrificing your life for others. It is caring for those in need. It is developing the talents that God has given you. It is allowing yourself to be transformed into God's image through the inevitable sufferings that come into your life. It's like what Micah 6, 8 says. He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And for the life of me, I don't recall anywhere in the Bible that says what is good is to claim that God's entire gospel of salvation in Christ is dependent on whether or not you think Adam and Eve had a pet dinosaur. Number three. Don't get nasty and hateful with young earth creationists, even if you find yourself really hurt by them. It doesn't do anybody any good to ruthlessly mock and denigrate young earth creationists and groups like it, Answers in Genesis. It belittles you, and it actually helps feed into their narrative that they are being persecuted. That is not to say that a humorous jibe or a clever quip when pointing out any one of their many outrageous claims is a bad thing. Like in any debate, 
humor and clever cleverness is fine. In fact, you need to have a sense of humor when discussing young earth creationism. I mean, look at this picture. Look closely at the animals represented in it. That's really funny. There's a difference between humor and sheer meanness. I realize it's sometimes hard not to slip into that. I think one time I told the guy he was dumber than a bag of hammers. Not my finest moment. But the thing to remember is that people, that the people who arrested, beat, and handed Jesus over to be crucified were the religious leaders of Jesus' own people. And part of what it, he exemplified is the willingness to take the beatings without repaying in kind. And so, dang it, if you're a Christian, you're called to imitate Christ. So even if a nasty comment sneaks out here and there, do your best to curb that desire to repay in kind. Number four, don't play nice with young earth creationists like Ken Ham. Don't play nice with young earth creationists like Ken Ham. At the same time, it isn't good just to play nice and refuse to say anything at any time that might be construed as being mean. Again, if you read through the Gospels, Jesus could really take it to the Pharisees sometimes. And just look what he did when he got to the temple. Sometimes it is right and good to confront someone who is doing something wrongful, wrong and hurtful. I know a few people objected to the title of my book, The Heresy of Ham on the grounds that it sounded too confrontational. My response to that is, it is confrontational. It is challenging the basic claims of young earth creationism in light of the fundamental tenets of the historical Christian faith. And it is calling Ken Ham out on the vitriol that he has put out there in which he savages fellow Christians simply because they disagree with him. Divisive, hateful behavior needs to be challenged and called out. When Ken Ham claims biblical authority and then turns around and claims a pre-flood civilization through innocent people to savage dinosaurs in their pre-flood coliseums, one has to say, no, that's not in the Bible. And when he claims that if you don't believe there are time zones in space or that Adam and Eve had perfect genomes, then you are a compromised Christian, one has to say, no, that has never been part of the Christian faith. Simply put, don't let yourself be bullied and stand up to the bully when you see other people getting verbally abused by that bully. Number five, don't worry, but rather have faith that truth is revealed in the light. The Catholic monk Thomas Merton once said something to the effect, there's no need to defend the truth. You just have to make sure that you bring it to light. The truth can take care of itself. The number one priority for a Christian shouldn't be to defend anything. It should rather be to shine the light on what is true. If you're a Bible scholar, shine the light on what a certain passage says. If you're a scientist, shine the light on what certain theories, like evolution, really say, and let the truth speak for itself. Number six, we need to realize that all this debate is actually kind of necessary. What I mean by that is this. This is how we learn and grow, both individually and as a society. I actually started looking into this whole issue when, ben, when the Ben Stein movie, Expelled, came out in 2008. It was about the intelligent design movement. At first, I thought it was a good movie, but then I started to look more closely at it. Now, at the time, I would have said I didn't think evolution was true. Microevolution? Sure. Macroevolution? Not a chance. In any case, I got into a conversation with a guy who had huge problems with the intelligent design movement. And to make a long story short, it was because of that conversation that I started to look into the whole creation evolution debate more. And eventually I got to the position I am now. I'm a Christian who believes in Christ and who is convinced that much of the theory of evolution is scientifically correct. If future discoveries change that view, great. It won't bother me either way. But the point is, it took time for me to research and think things through. And it takes time for anyone to think these things through. That's how we learn. Number seven, finally, don't forget, there's a whole lot more in the Bible beyond Genesis 1 through 11. Now, don't get me wrong. Genesis 1 through 11 is extremely important. 
in it is extremely important in that it lays out the overarching backdrop to the rest of the Bible. But we have to remember that Genesis 1 through 11 is pretty useless if we don't read beyond it. It's the back curtain and the backdrop, if you will, to the stage of biblical history. But if all you do is stare at the back curtain, you're going to miss the play going on throughout the pages of Scripture. So by all means, debate creation evolution. Talk about how to interpret Genesis 1 through 11. I know I do. But don't neglect looking at the whole biblical story. That's something that Ken Ham kind of tends to do. I realize this post might have been proven to be a tad more dull than the previous ones, but I wanted to lay these thoughts out before I write the two concluding posts about the, the Nye-Ham debate. The rebuttals and the questions and answers time.